Witnesses have seen headless hounds, decapitated bodies. Dickens was an active supporter of the Christmas ghost story movement. It is green jean, she said to herself. Welcome to Friday Night Ghost Rites from Haunted Road Media. I'm author and ghost story and Mike Ricksecker. Explore with us. Back in the 1800s, it was actually customary to tell ghost stories around Christmas time. While that tradition has fell out of practice over the years, it is actually starting to make some headway yet again. Here are some Christmas ghost stories for your holiday season. We'll start with Headless Tom in Westminster, Maryland. On the bitter cold night of Christmas Eve, 1844, Big Tom Park sat alone in his cell without a single visitor to wish him well. Arrested for the fourth time in four months for disturbing the peace, visitors of other prisoners shied away from Tom's cell, afraid he may try to provoke something while they visited loved ones. With nothing to do, Tom sat quietly in his cell and listened. The sheriff was at a loss as to what to do with Big Tom. Tom Parks was a large, strong man, and it took three men to help drag Tom to his jail cell. The sheriff worried that the jail wouldn't be able to contain Parks, and wondered out loud whether he should have the prisoner sent to the Baltimore Penitentiary. Unhinged at the idea of spending time in a high-security prison, Big Tom took his own life on Christmas Day, finding something sharp enough to slice his own throat. In an odd twist, a phrenologist, one who studies the bone structure of the head in relation to psychological and intellectual traits, was called to the jail to take a look at Tom. He was enamored by the size of Tom's head and removed it in order to perform research. The rest of Tom Park's body was buried in a local cemetery. To this day, it is said that Big Tom Parks still haunts and roams the old jail, arms outstretched, in search of his missing body part. Oak Hill Park, East Barnett, UK. Sir Geoffrey de Mandeville was the first Earl of Essex and was considered the worst of several cruel and lawless barons under King Stephen of England in the 1140s. Geoffrey played both sides of a power struggle between King Stephen and his rival Matilda and was eventually arrested for treason in 1143 and then excommunicated. He ended up trading his castles for his freedom, but then launched a rebellion to try to get his wealth back, plundering the Finland around the Isle of Ely. In response, Stephen besieged Geoffrey, and Geoffrey took a chance shot from an arrow that eventually killed him a month later. Because he had been excommunicated, he was denied burial at the monastery that he actually founded, and it's said that's why his ghost haunts the remains of the woods at East Barnet and Hadley, even though he was eventually buried at Temple Church. Churchill Road, which runs alongside Oak Hill Park in East Barnet, is said to be the ghost promenade. Witnesses have seen headless hounds, decapitated bodies, and specters in the trees. But it's Sir Geoffrey de Mandeville's spirit that's the most prominent at the park, so much so that every six years they host a ghost hunt there to try and spot his apparition. Does he perhaps appear there during Christmas, since it was the Christmas court of 1141 in which he bought his pardon for treason? The Garrett Jacobs Mansion in Baltimore, Maryland was built by the president of the b and Railroad in 1884. The Engineers Club took control of the building in 1961 and have felt the presence of others ever since. They've seen shadowy figures as well as a full table of apparitions raising their glasses in the dining room. But the most notorious spirit is probably the former handyman. During one holiday season, Peter Weston, the former food and beverage director, moved a very heavy statue for the women's auxiliary but the next morning, it had returned to its original place. Weston asked Manny the Handyman about what happened with the sculpture, but Manny denied knowing anything about it. The Handyman actually turned in his resignation on Christmas Eve, his final working day to be New Year's Eve. However, he unexpectedly took ill and died on December 31st. Nearly a month later, Weston was working downstairs and saw Manny sitting at the bar where he normally took his break. Weston said, hello, Manny, then turned around shocked but Manny had disappeared. Then there's the Green Lady of Weems Castle in Scotland. Near the shore of the Firth of Forth in Scotland, south of Coal Town of Weems, stands Weems Castle. It was built in 1421 by Sir John Weems and is probably best known as the location where Mary Queen of Scots met her future husband, Lord Darnley, in 1565. However, it is also the site of a ghost known as the Green Lady or Green Jean. And while there have been many sightings of this ghostly apparition over the centuries, perhaps the most well-known is the Christmas account recorded in 1904 by the Countess of Munster, Wilhelmina Fitzclarence, in her book, My Memories and Miscellanies. And I'm actually going to go ahead and read you part of that account. 
There was a large party staying at Weems Castle for Christmas, and my sister had arranged some theatricals for Christmas evening for the amusement of her guests. She had driven out to Kirkcaldy, the nearest town in those days, to purchase several requisites for the evening's amusement, and had not returned when what I'm about to relate took place. I ought to have begun by saying that the ghost of Weems Castle was always styled Green Jean and was supposed to appear in the form of a beautiful, tall, slim lady clad in a long gown of green that swished very much as she walked, or rather glided by. No one seemed to know her history or, at all events, it was a subject which was to be avoided. But to my story. My niece and her friend were talking over the coming theatricals. Nothing could be heard but their two voices, in the violent rain which was pounding against the window. Suddenly, a rustling sound smote their ears as if coming from the stage. They looked up, the curtain, however, remained down. But presently, it was gently pushed aside to make room for the entry of a tall, pale-looking lady dressed in green who held a sort of Egyptian lamp, lit. The lady took no notice of either of the girls, but holding the lamp well in front of her, she walked calmly, her long gown swishing after her as she went, up to the door before mentioned in front of the curtain. She opened it, passed into the room, and closed it noiselessly. My niece was much excited. She sprang to the door, and taking the handle in her hand, she called out to her companion, get a candle, quickly. There is no way out of that room into which she is gone, and it is quite dark. The other girl hurriedly brought a light and ran to the door. They opened it. It was pitch dark, no sign of the green lady. To their amazement, she had disappeared into space. Not long after, my sister herself saw the green lady. On the evening of the event I'm about to relate, it was, as often is the case in Bonnie, Scotland, a pouring wet night. My sister's son had been out riding most of the day, and he being, at the time, rather delicate chested, his mother was anxious that he should come home. Suddenly, she heard the doorbell ring and her son's hasty footsteps into his sitting room and thence to his bedroom. Feeling much relieved and knowing a young man's dislike to espionage, even as regards to his health, she waited quietly in her sitting room. In about a half an hour's time, hearing no more, she put her head into his sitting room and walked through into his bedroom, which was lit by gas. Seeing that his wet clothes were all lying on the ground, she was satisfied and made good her way out into the gallery, when, to her surprise, she saw about 20 yards off, coming towards her along the gallery, a tall lady in green. Although the house was full of guests, my sister could not conceive for a moment who this lady could be, for it was someone she had never seen before. The lady walked in a slow, dignified fashion and seemed in no way put out at seeing another person on the gallery. For a moment, my sister stared in astonishment, but in a flash, she felt who it was. It is Green Jean, she said to herself, and I shall wait till she comes up to me, and then I shall walk by her side and see what she will say. She waited. Green Jean joined her, but she turned her head away. My sister moved on by her side, but as she afterwards told me, felt tongue-tied. The figure accompanied her to the end of the gallery and then was gone. My sister felt, I think, annoyed with herself for not having done or said something. But then afterwards, someone rebuked her for her faint-heartedness, and she said truly, I walked by her the whole length of the gallery, and I don't think there are many who would have done that. But speak, I could not. And that is the story of the Green Lady of Weems Castle. And then there's the most famous Christmas ghost story, and how it relates to the Omni Parker House Hotel in Boston, Massachusetts. Of course, the most famous fictional ghost story is A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, but his writing of this tale wasn't just some random act of inspiration. Dickens was an active supporter of the Christmas ghost story movement and encouraged others to create ghost stories for the holiday editions of his magazines. Dickens also took A Christmas Carol on the road, including America, performing it as a one-man play with unique voices for all the characters. Up in his room, he would practice his performance of A Christmas Carol over and over again in front of a large mirror acting out each part of the story. It's said that his spirit still haunts that mirror to this day, and sometimes people spot a visage of him performing his reading of his classic Christmas tale. The mirror now hangs in the hotel's mezzanine. 
Deep Creek Lake, Maryland. One Christmas, a man and a number of his friends were riding snowmobiles out on the frozen lake. There was an unfortunate accident when one of the snowmobiles broke through the ice and three of the men drowned. The wives of one of the men had been at the cabin decorating the Christmas tree with their daughters when there was a knock on the door. When she answered, her husband was standing there, dripping wet. She tried to grab him to rush him inside, but her hand went through his form and he disappeared. She thought she was imagining things and closed the door, but a few minutes later, a sheriff's deputy came by and delivered the terrible, tragic Christmas news. Thank you for watching. Please check out our other ghost story videos off on the side. I'm Mike Ricksecker. Until next Friday night.